All right, friends, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see such a, a great crowd here. We arranged the room specifically to accommodate more people. We knew there would be a great deal of interest in this dialogue. And, uh, and for me, it's a privilege to be able to, to host it and, uh, and, and moderate it. Uh, we're here, as you know, to discuss the question of integral human development. Uh, what, what, is that, what does that mean? Or integral human fulfillment, as you'll hear in uh, a, a different way of approaching the question, uh, the vocabulary for it, at least. Uh, but the idea of integral human development has been the currency around here, thanks to the Keogh School uh, in particular, over the last few years, as it was sort of um, enshrined as, as the core thematic element of the Keogh School. And many of us were associated with it ever since we've been trying to grapple with exactly what ought that to mean. Uh, we know certain ways in which the idea of integral human development has been drawn from the tradition of Catholic social thought. Uh, and refers to um, a, uh, a view of development focused on the dignity of the human person that really comprehends the full aspects of, of human flourishing, uh, not just uh, economic development, um, but also those dimensions that go to uh, personal development and even spiritual aspects of, of a human person. And it's uh, been uh, observed uh, in a lot of our work at the Kellogg Institute over the last few years, work that you and Sabina has interacted with over the years, over these years, that uh, this this broader ideal of human development, in in many ways, tracks the the expansion and growth and evolution of the thinking about development within the sphere of international uh, development work as well as uh, a, a more narrow conception of development focused only on certain material needs or income has given way towards more expansive understandings of what ought to be pursued within the development space in order to contribute more broadly to human well-being uh, across many dimensions. Um, and so exploring a little bit of, the, of that interaction is, is where I think our starting point is here today um, with two sort of extraordinary interlocutors. Um, it's a conversation that we've been trying to have for probably about five or six years, actually. We first tried to arrange this in London. It didn't quite work. Uh, we've got a second shot at, at it here. Um, it, uh, it, it began with um, uh, having uh, Professor John Finnis, my colleague at the Wall School since 19, well, 1995. You've been there. I came in 1996. Uh, throughout this time, as the Bielkini family a professor of law. Uh, throughout that time, he's also been professor of law and legal philosophy at Oxford for many decades. Um, and fair to say, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, really one of the, the most distinguished and influential legal philosophers, certainly in the English language of our time, period. Uh, and certainly uh, the foremost philosopher of natural law in our era. Um, and uh, Professor Finnis has throughout his uh, development of his, his, um, his ideas, um, spoken very specifically about integral human fulfillment. Let's, let's, let's say a little bit more about it. Um, it happens that uh, Sabine Alkair, who uh, did her doctorate at Oxford, um, engaged in her early work, John's work on uh, reasons for action in his theories of natural law and natural rights. Um, and uh, Sabine has gone on to, to be today the director of the Oxford um, uh, Poverty and Human Development uh, Initiative, OFI, and through OFI, uh, her work has been focused on developing uh, uh, an understanding, a multidimensional understanding of poverty, uh, one that is uh, been developed not only at a theoretical or conceptual level, but also very much at a practical level, having a great impact on development practice through the development of certain measurements associated with the multidimensional poverty index, um, which in various forms is used by, I think, over 100 different countries uh, uh, around the world. So, um, uh, so that to, to be able to have both of them here in dialogue around this idea of integral human development, multidimensional poverty, integral human fulfillment, uh, this collection of different concepts that all try to get at more ample understandings of human well-being and flourishing 
and in particular how they might relate to development policy and practice is really what we're here to talk about today. So thank you uh, both for, for being willing to do that. I wonder if we just start with just a very broad and general um, uh, question uh, to, to help us understand how for each of you your thinking has evolved on this question. How did you first come to the ideas that you that you're working with? Where did they originate and, and how they perhaps have uh, changed a little bit over the time you've been working on them? Yeah, thank you, Carla. Uh, well, when you asked me to think about that, I, I wondered when I came across this idea. And uh, I, I think it's clear that I, I really started thinking along these lines in 1977 um, at Marine. So in 1977, I was spending uh, in the middle of two years teaching law, uh, running the law school in the University of Malawi. Um, uh, for reasons that are a bit obscure to me, well, I step back. I, one of my aspirations there was to uh, take further steps towards completing a, a project that I started in 1967, or indeed late 1966, when my old supervisor, Professor Asia Lay Hart, asked me to contribute a book to his series of. of Books on legal theory uh, called, he said, uh, to be called Natural Law and Natural Rights. So I said, yeah, I'll do that. Um, he gave you the title. He gave me the title. Uh, and he, he repeated it right within five seconds. So it's here if you want to. And I said, yes. And I said, I'll finish it by Christmas 1970. And he said, don't hurry. So 1975 came and I didn't make much progress. By the time I was working in, in Malawi, I, I, for various reasons, was able to make progress and it, I went back to Oxford after that with this book and it came out in 1980. Now, in the book, uh, I uh, developed a, an account of fundamental basic reasons for action which direct us towards basic and fundamental human goods. Uh, aspects of human flourishing or well-being or fulfillment. And that list was developed on a number of bases, but on the basis of what's about a lot of social anthropological accounts, what's to be gained by reflecting in a, an informed cultural way about uh, what people reveal about their fundamental reasons for action in novels and history and so forth. And also the list of fundamental first principles of practical reasons. Thomas Aquinas develops in his account of law uh, in the first part of the second part of the Summa Theologiae. He there seeking to fill a gap in Western culture. Aristotle had talked greatly about practical haven't given us any account of its first principles. I have first principles on the Aristotelian theory, but there was nothing there. And no one had really systematically set out to fill in the gap until Sir Holland did. So I was working with a number of, of um, sources of, uh, of a, a table, a list, an account uh, of first principles, fundamental reasons for action. And uh, I, I I provide that in the book, and then I argue that those are not yet moral reasons. The idea of morality is a development of that account, so the quotation so to speak, of those through one of them, which is the idea of being reasonable in one's pursuit for others. Now, um, the book itself, in its first edition, the one that came out in 1980, uh, stops more or less there. It does, it does not itself contain the idea of it. By 1981, a year later, it was clear to me that the, the uh, secondary, second level principles that give moral force to the pursuit of the first level fundamental are themselves integrated in a way that I hadn't envisaged in writing the first edition. Uh, and the integrating principle of them is what uh, my 
colleague, uh, Jermaine Greenday, had already by that time by that, by that time been equal human fulfillment, defined as the fulfillment flourishing of all persons, individuals, fulfillment of myself, and of everyone else, uh, of all human persons and groups <laughs> we're from here on now. But I knew Green Day from 1974 when we met uh, to we both individually read like four chapters on his moral uh, catechism for adults. It was rejected at the time and then it was published and became a bestseller by uh, the brothers Lawler and Donald Wirth. And uh, we were assigned the task of writing four chapters. And so I had, of course, I got through a crash course in moral theology and so on. And the fourth of those chapters was on Catholic Central. Maybe word had gone out uh, about this, uh, whatever the reason, I received in July an invitation to attend the conference of the Holy See Commission on Justice and Peace. International Commission on Justice and Peace. Uh, a joint meeting of them with uh, the World Council of Churches body, which well, the, the, the body that was organized, created by both the Holy See and the World Council, Council of Churches, based in Geneva, called uh, Soli Pact, the Committee on Society, Justice, and Peace. Um, at this joint meeting outside of Rome, I was to present uh, a paper, as it were, on behalf of the Commission for Justice and Peace, which I've never had any dealings with before, on Catholic social teaching since Populorum Progressio, meaning including Populorum Progressio and, and the 10 years uh, after that. I suppose the meeting was in some way a celebration of the anniversary of Populorum Progressio. Populorum Progressio was an encyclical of Paul VI. Um, and let me just say what I said in the first paragraph of, of the um, paper that I gave, for which I had to squat up a lot uh, in, in, out there in Malawi with, with all the documents that I could lay hands on out there uh, since between Populorum Progressio and 1977. So I said the purpose of Populorum Progressio was to create, so that it's, um, its subtitle it was uh, on the development of peace. <coughs> the purpose was to create a new imaginative horizon in which the social question, which is what Leonard Durkin called his foundation of the encyclical uh, of uh, Rara Navarra in 1891, on the social question, in which the social question will be seen and felt to have become worldwide. To help everybody grasp, I'm quoting the Pope uh, Paul VI here, to help everyone grasp this serious problem in all its dimensions and to convince them that solidarity in action at this turning point in human history is a matter of urgency. Then I say, where the papal and conciliar documents of the early and mid 60s have on the whole the form and tone of treatises, popular and progressive as the form and tone of an appeal, quote, again from paragraph five of the document, an appeal for concrete action towards what the English translation then was man's complete development and the development of all mankind. Now the encyclical, I think, uh, was written in certain French, um, and in the French, that sentence comes out as the development intégral, the long of the human person, in the development solidaire, the humanité, a not solidary development, solidarity development, confused with solidarity development of, of humanity. So the, these two aspects um, run together. And I say these, the ambition of the encyclical is to hold in tension two poles while charging each pole with the maximum moral force. The one pole is extensive, the horizon of, as I put it, all men, the whole of humanity, all become our neighbors and brothers. The other pole is intensive, fully rounded, 
development of the whole plan, the whole thing. Might take me some citation. So that's how I got into it. And I, the word integral is not there, and I certainly have stayed in the self in French. Um, the, the word integral in English comes to the surface, uh, certainly uh, in 1987, mm -hmm. with the celebration of 20 years of the Royal Congress here by Pope John Paul II in the integral solicitor to the reign socialis, uh, where it again appears in a bit in Italian. An integral of uh, human development is an English translation, not the word that I put in, in Italian and in Latin, in, in paragraph 13 of that. Now, so there's a bit of, uh, of background. Um, whether in picking up the term integral human fulfillment in the sense that I find it Rize or I or I. Influenced by this language uh, of the socialist. I don't know, I suspect yes, it was. Um, the, the two ideas are not identical, but I don't think they're substantially, substantially different. There's a, there's a common misunderstanding of the term, and we use it in our moral philosophy, moral, political, social, religious philosophy, um, namely that. That when we talk about it, we're talking about the fulfillment of one person, the acting person, uh, which is one way of reading Aristotle's account of ethics. It's a very misleading way, I think, uh, but it's a very common way. But that's a falsification of the idea. The idea is of the person. The fulfillment, yes, of the acting person, but also of all the active persons for whom that person is in some way responsible. But beyond them, in principle, it's the fulfillment of everyone because each of the basic reasons for action is as much reason for my action as you of this thing. The good, say, of knowledge or of friendship or of life and health or of sociability or of marriage or of practical reasonableness itself, or of religion, is a good for me, but it's a good for everyone. And I don't understand it adequately well, or really at all, unless I see that it's as good for you as it is for me. As good, so it acknowledges what I mentioned. It's as good for the girl or the boy in the next desk as I first get the idea of knowledge, and then I'm good at knowledge. And um, the ignorant benefit of charity and insight and information. I get the same at the same time the insight that it's good for anyone, anyone. So it's out of me for all human beings. Thank you. Uh, so, so Sabina, in your book Valuing Freedoms, you worked with uh, reasons for action um, that, that John was proposing and working with as well, and um, in, then. Since then, I mean, you work has been developed in developing the, the idea of multidimensional poverty and so forth. So, draw the line for us from from the starting point. Why and how were those ideas important to you? But also, where have you taken them? How have they evolved in your work? So, I think I would step back a little bit. I did first an MPhil in theology and did some political ethics, um, and I had come from some volunteer work and was observing the poverty reduction activities that were often done by Christian organizations were focusing on the material aspects of poor people's lives, but perhaps were overlooking the fullness of the realities of the poor people and their relationality, their joy, their uh, many of the richness of their life was in a sense not engaged in, in activities just to reduce um, poverty. And so my MPhil thesis was focused on Catholic social teachings and comparing them with the documents of the World Bank when it had, in 1991, returned to having a poverty focus um, and tried to look at how the incipient concept of poverty in Popolo and Progressio and the other social teachings and the idea inherent in the World Bank's documents were different. 
So looking at the dimensionality of poverty in that space and finding whether it's amenities in the environment or whether it was prayer, that there were, there were differences um, in what in a sense was, was in play, in you know, a vocation to fulfillment. And um, then I became very interested in the Marcus Sen's capability approach. And so my master's and my doctorate in economics focused on the Sen's approach. And um, in 1985, in one of the pivotal <coughs> lectures published as Wellbeing Agency and Freedom in the Journal of Philosophy, he articulated the capability approach as focusing on well-being, where well-being has many aspects which are not plural, which are plural, which are not simply reducible to utility in contrast with the utilitarian focus of economics. Um, also on agency, which is a person's ability to advance um, states that they have reason to value. Um, and also focusing on plural principles, um, so not being able to simply maximize any one good, but needing to engage with, with different um, principles that would be able to rule out um, uh, perhaps less desirable circumstances, but not perhaps come to a different solution. And so that was a structure I was working within, and I read Professor Finnis's work, and for me, a lot of pieces dropped into place that were missing. So in Sen's work, there's a focus on valuable capabilities, but not necessarily an articulation of foundationally what it is to be valuable, or of a structure of understanding what capabilities different communities value. And the basic reasons for actions in natural law and natural rights very much filled that space in a way that was valuable partly because it was so, so terribly clear, um, but also it, uh, it was open to understanding and listening to different instantiations of those goods in different places. Um, and similarly, the principles of practical reasonableness um, gave content and identity to part of Sen's work, which is, is there but without the structure. And for a move into practical work, structures are, um, are, are very important. And so I was very honored, and I'm very intimidated to be here with my doctor and co-supervisor. <laughs> um, but this, this work really, for me, um, brought a lot of pieces together. And um, just to give an example of, of how we used it, so my doctoral work was focused on income, poverty generate, income generation activities, mainly for women in Pakistan. And so you would do the economic rate of return, or economic internal rate of return and net present value, all of the the economic analyses of these income generation projects, but then also sit with the women and say, well, what was important for you? And so they would describe what the activities did, and, and then you would say, and what else, and what else? And in a sense, trying to bring out in a very um, iterative way, very much like you ask yourself, why do I do what I do to get at the fundamental reasons of action? Asking them what was valuable about this project. And indeed, what came out was they valued the knowledge, they valued the friendship, they valued the fact that in a rose cultivation program that <coughs> roses in order to make garlands to sell for adorning the Holy Quran, um, that this was sawab, this was holy work. It was also beautiful work. Um, and this fragrance of the roses infiltrated their clothes, it affected their relationships. They were destitute women in the community. And previously, they wouldn't have been invited into other people's homes, but now, they were invited in because again, what they were selling was a worthy product. Um, and so, so getting a much more well-rounded understanding in terms of human development of the impacts um, that these had on people's lives. And very concretely, um, in a focus group discussion in a participatory setting, having some reasons of action in the back of your mind means that if they <coughs> overlook one, you can ask, well, I have no idea if this is valuable for you, but, but might this project also have impacted, for example, your knowledge. And then they would talk about, yes, we learned that these roses mildew, we learned how to make rose water, we learned how many buds to put on a garland, we learned how to negotiate in the market, we learned, so they would speak about the knowledge. And so it, it, the PRA, Participatory Research and Action, open menu approach was very useful, but I also found that the basic reasons for action were useful in helping communities not to lose sight of something that they might have overlooked in the heat of a, of a discussion or a, a focus group. Um, so that's a little bit about how they came in to the work at the beginning. Oh, thank you. So, so, so much of what you describe and then what you go on to do with the, the idea of multi-dimensional poverty 
multidimensional poverty index is in some senses bringing in dimensions of human well-being and flourishing that have in the past largely been ignored in a lot of the development thinking and practice. And you've gone on to talk about other missing dimensions too, you know, uh, in the interactions that we've had and your other engagements with the Kellogg Institute. I wonder what, what, um, what's your assessment now of where development thinking and practice is about <coughs> these dimensions of human flourishing? What is what has been, um, what's still missing in particular? Uh, what, are the, what are the aspects that, uh, that you think are most important but that we're not perhaps seeing when we look at the, the gap between an integral understanding of human development or fulfillment and what is actually attended to in the world of development thinking and practice? So um, I can think in measurement terms and then also a little bit more generally in policy terms, which might be interesting here. Yeah. Um, in measurement terms, um, when we measure multidimensional poverty, a question is what are the dimensions of poverty? But we are also very much restricted by the data sets that we have. And so for a global measure that covers over 100 countries that we do, um, we cannot go beyond health, education, and living standards not because other dimensions are not widely recognized to be important, like violence or disempowerment or employment, but because the same surveys do not have these indicators. Um, so a first engagement, perhaps, is trying to think of the, the common sources of information that enable us to measure what matters and what where we are, in a sense, blind. Um, and so one of the first things our research center did was to read a lot of participatory studies of poor communities and observe that some of the things that always come up, like unsafe work or um, informal work or disempowerment or violence and physical danger or shame, humiliation, and social isolation, that these are important to poor people, but regularly not present in the multi-topic household surveys that are the creators of poverty measures um, throughout the world, and whether they are uh, and, and for us, for multidimensional poverty measures. And so we did little short modules trying to, to draw on <coughs> questions that were feasible, comparable, had been implemented, used, and analyzed, giving rise to both public research and to policy action, so that they were, in a sense, um, ready to go as, as questions, and try to think of how we could use <coughs> these as modules um, that could be more optional, so that many poverty surveys would have in the same survey whether you were a victim of violence and what kinds of deprivation you suffered, or uh, degrees of autonomy, um, and be going beyond decision making, which is a very limited and poorly measured concept, to wider understandings of autonomy. Um, and so, in a sense, that's one question that remains a standing question. It's not something that the Sustainable Development Goals have advanced. It's not something that um, there's been a lot of work on, but there is increasingly a recognition that at least violence and employment are part of that. Um, there's also a need perhaps to measure some of the less um, the psychological or the, the, the fonts of meaning and, and, and spirituality, which are, again, difficult to measure. But with the happiness literature rising and the psychological literature rising, there are interesting approaches to those. We weren't sure whether to consider them poverty, but we had that as a, as a fifth missing dimension that we considered and developed um, using both the mood, the satisfaction, the mean autonomy, and competence different uh, definitions of psychological well-being. Um, I think the, the other part of that is that there are some contexts, such as Bhutan, where gross national happiness is a, an idea of well-being, which has nine domains, many of which mirror basic reasons for action. So I've been privileged and honored to be able to work in that context, where they have the political energy and a dedicated survey instrument to try to be able to measure implement, analyze, and act upon um, a more integral human development concept, human fulfillment concept, um, but in a very different context. I think the other aspect is more a wish list, if I could have one, um, of how these ideas and the basic reasons for action could come into our policy work. Um, I'll give a sad story and then, then perhaps something else. Um, going back to the context of Bhutan I just mentioned, um, the higher education to Bhutan was very happily brought in by a Jesuit um, who was really a leader um, and a person who 
is, is very well regarded in the country for bringing in a, a system of higher education to value for it many of the practicalities. And yet that system of, out, of higher education was a very Western, very secular idea. And so now within that same country, they are looking for values education. They're looking for ways not to exclude their fonts of meaning, their own values, um, because what was important was excluded, uh, excluded those. And so in, in, in terms of a wish list, Germain Grise um, had many, many case studies, letters that he worked through in terms of how these reasons for action, these principles, could be um, used in practice. And they could be used, whether it's in Harvard Business case study method teachings courses or others. But I think it, it is so often the case that in human development or in policy spaces, we automatically restrict ourselves to what it is convenient or acceptable to talk about. And so self-limit self things that we know could be important because we're not sure how to talk about them or we're, we're actually not sure how to bring an integrated human development framework into that language. And so it might be useful in, this, in the safety of a classroom to try to really work through how those might impact our work and then to think, okay, with academic rigor, with all of the constraints and publishing that we have in academic institutions, what of that we also might use because it would be of value even to people that we might be a little bit reticent about sharing our views with, it actually might be something that would find a chord with them as it may, might have done in the past. Thank you. Um, so John, staying still on this, departing still from this idea of sort of the, the um, missing dimensions uh, of, of development in prevailing thought, I mean, one of the things that's striking to so many of us um, who have pay any attention to the development sphere is often how individualistic the conceptions of development are, um, implicitly or explicitly. And, and you, by contrast, um, in the decades after natural law and natural rights, have devoted a lot of your thinking to the goods uh, of marriage and family in particular, among other forms of, of community, but really distinctively those kinds of friendship and community. And, um, and I wonder what, you know, what, what the implications of, are of your thinking of marriage and family as an, and a relationship to human flourishing um, and how that differs from what you see in theorists like Sen or Nussbaum or more, more broadly in the development space? Yeah, that's a great question because there's also the question why marriage uh, appear in the list in natural law and natural rights uh, in the first edition and does appear in the second edition. Um, and uh, I remember sitting in a seminar in Washington with my colleague with whom I talked to for the entire first year, Joseph Raz. Um, uh, I mean, I talked with him and, and Ronald Walk in a joint seminar for very, very many years. And there we were in Washington, not in Oxford, uh, and he ironized <coughs> the uh, sudden appearance of a new basic good. <laughs> So it wasn't that in writing natural law and natural rights, I didn't think about this, but I uh, partly, I, I'm ashamed to say, was misled by the English translation and the Latin text that accompanied it of uh, Thomas Aquinas's list of basic first principles and practical reasons, or basic reasons for action, basic treatment. Uh, and in the then newish, new, Cutting edge uh, English Dominican translation uh, by Thomas Gilby uh, coming out in the 1960s. Uh, uh, he himself translated the volume that has questions, questions 90 through 97 of the Freemason Rebellion. He, claiming to follow the critical text uh, at the relevant point, which is after the value of life and so on, quotes Aquinas uh, as talking about. Um, commixtio, which is just as the Latin word for sexual intercourse, sexual having sex. Uh, but the critical text is in fact um, uh, conjugium. And he, he said, he always said when he was departing from the British came to tell us the difference. I discovered that it was conjugium. And conjunctio, conjugium, conjunctio uh, is the Latin uh, Roman law concept of marriage. And at that point, Aquinas is quoting a text from a Roman lawyer, Alvin, and it means 
his marriage, uh, and he's saying the marriage is good. I had misled by by that presentation for well, sex is not wisdom. Uh, in that sense, it's sex one thing. So reproduction and friendship. So it's an nearby concepts and so marriage and family sort of come in as a kind of combination of those two basic groups. But that's unsatisfactory. Of course, the contextual question is the question of what privacy is not the absolute secondary, but uh, I mean, it should be intrinsically the secondary, but it's important. I think it's um, and to some, some extent, historically, it, just, it really was the first person to think deeply about this in a systematic way. And at first thought, the idea that marriage is basically good seems strange and uh, now it's blind. And what about people who are married or give up marriage and so on? Are they cut off on a basic of the will? Uh, yes, um, so far so uh, And we should say something that um, cut off from the renouncing or renouncing for higher things uh, or an aspiration of vocation, etc. etc. Um, the irrelevant kind of disabled one. Anyway, I, I believe that um, this is all supported. The thought that marriage is a basic good is supported by uh, the anthropological, the social anthropological studies that I mentioned in my great deal of history and the mechanisms of post uh, experience and so forth. Uh, in, all, in the case of all these basic goods, uh, there's no proof that this is a basic good, but there are dialectical defenses. Say responses to objections which argue, no, this is not a basic good, it's just uh, some sort of uh, means to other ends, or it's a combination of the real basic goods, or some other way it's not itself uh, entitled to place on this notion of intrinsic inferiority of good reasons for action. Uh, and I believe that marriage can uh, should be defended as being an appropriate item which must be contracted with. Now, of course, then you have to think about what, what we mean by marriage. And in the case of all the basic reasons for action, in the case of all social institutions, um, it's the theme of my work, um, you can think that big institutions like law, political community, citizenship, friendship, anything, you have to think of central cases and then secondary watered down, immature, decadent cases. It's the central cases that give you the full intelligibility and the full value of our intelligibility, reason for action, kind of aspect of fulfillment, etc. Uh, so you can think, well, what's the central case of marriage? And then you think of well, more or less secondary or more or less immediate cases, legally, financially, etc. Et um, and you have to defend the claim of this is the central case against objections. Uh, free marriage, uh, serial marriage, and so on. Are they central cases? Difficult discussion, more, dis more difficult now than it was 10 years ago, more difficult than that was 30 years ago. But necessary, because we're dealing with an absolutely foundational social reality. If you ask people <coughs> how how well their life had gone, or succeeded, or failed, what they were utterly disappointed about, and so on. Th this range of questions, including what became of my children, whether they went off and did playboys or, or not, uh, that sort of question is, is very central to uh, people's reasonable self understanding of, of the value of their life. Groups that they participate in. So, um, marriage uh, is uh, one of the best, best speakable about uh, topics. Uh, the idea of same sex marriage, which was unheard of, thought of, except by very fast sighted people like Jimmy Bizet. Um, back in the 1960s, he was saying, well, we go down a certain route. There will be no reason why we should have marriage between people of the same sex. Um, at the time, people would have that's just extravagant, horrible advice. But 
see. Um, so we have to engage in dialectics about whether that's a central case or a very deviant case uh, built in, building in injustice for children. And we need to have that conversation. I mean, we must have, have one significant, but um, uh, it doesn't get easier to conduct, although the intrinsic reasons and the valid conclusions remain on the table. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll just ask one more question before I open it up to the others, just, even though I would have a dozen more that I'd like to ask. Um, and, and one, maybe I can direct it simultaneously to both of you. Already in your description, Sabina, of um, the way that your thinking and work evolve, you emphasize several times participatory forms of engagement with uh, local communities in, in terms of even understanding what, what are the dimensions of human well-being that they themselves value and have reason to value, right? Um, where does this, this form of participation fit in to development today? And um, uh, what, um, what, what else needs to be done or, or how should we be thinking about the, the goals of where a thick understanding of participation fits into the development space and, and understanding integral human development? And, I, and I, I, I think it's a question that can um, work for, for both of you in a certain sense, John, because so much of your work has also been thinking deeply about subsidiarity, where subsidiarity fits in to, um, to natural law, to the common good, to human flourishing in general. And, and, and in some senses, these are parallel ideas, I think, of thick understandings of local participation and, and subsidiarity. So for both of you, where do these ideas fit into development work and practice, what needs to be done to sort of give them greater, um, uh, the roles that are due to them and, and so forth. What's your, what's your thinking about that? Do you want to begin? Sure. Um, so I think, um, I'll start with the measurement and then go to a thicker understanding. Um, so one of the gaps in terms of participation is that we often, guide development policies by different measures, by different analyses, and these are done in universities, in English, or in the national language, not in local languages. They're published uh, online, and they're not shared back with the local communities, who then are not informed about their own situation, and therefore empowered to make further the actions. And so, uh, very crudely, there's a focus in the Sustainable Development Goals of disaggregating data, which is very good, which disaggregate means you, you bring it down and so you have subnational or local level information and you can then do reports and put them in a local language. But there's less of an emphasis on how that information is shared, who receives it who, and who acts upon it. Um, another lack um, is in how we collect data. So either we use big data or we have administrative data or we have household survey data. And then we in our offices sit and figure out who's poor. Um, but the enumerator who goes and says, how many children do you have? What level of education do you have? Thank you very much. Um, are you a victim of violence? Thank you very much. Uh, what is your housing? When they finish the interview, then they walk off with this information, but they don't share back with that person. How does your life stand alongside other people's lives? You know, what might you be able to do about this situation? And so I think that one of my self-criticisms is that I'm part of a community which is missing a big opportunity um, at, the, at the ground of data collection to also engage the data providers as agents, as actors, as people who are trying to shape their own locations. There are some examples that try to do this, um, a poverty stoplight program in, um, in from the Fundación Paraguaya or World Bank uh, have a, a pro progress, but it's not mainstream and it's not mainstreamed with really high quality statistics that come to be national measures. And so I think that that's a gap that we can see, but we need to meet for those of us working in measurement. Um, we need to meet it because if you look at studies of poor people who have moved out of poverty, for example, there was a, a very large study of moving out of poverty, which talked with uh, people who had stayed in poverty, churned around, moved in and out, and those who had moved poverty. And those who had moved out, they were asked, well, why did you move out? Was it government programs? 
Was it NGOs? Was it faith-based communities? Was it your family? Was it your wider kinship network? What was responsible? And 71% of the people said it was my own initiative. Yes, I got help from others, but I had to put the pieces together. I had to um, go to the government program. I had to engage my aunties in the city. I needed to do these different things. And so at some level, um, in order to reduce poverty, we can't do it without the actions and the energies of poor people. And that is both you know, empowering them in, in an external way, but it's also there's an internal motivation, confidence, um, use of phronesis of a practical reason that they need to do in order to take these steps. And so um, I think there's, there's support. What are some ways of doing it? So at a national level, I mentioned the example of Bhutan, which is one of the measures which looks across nine domains, health, education, living standards, governance, time use, and the environment, cultural, diversity, community, resilience, and psychological well-being, which includes spirituality, prayer, um, and the consideration of consequences of action. And what was interesting is when they released the first study of changes over time at, at a subnational level and national level in late 2015, there had been growth in GNH. So we don't know how big it is because no other country does GNH. So we can't say is our economic growth, is our GNH growth fast or slow? There's no comparison. But then when you pull it apart and say, well, how did that growth happen? Every living standard had gone up, income, housing, work, the number of days people were healthy, people with accesses of services, of water, sanitation, electricity, access to road, um, rubbish disposal, all of those had increased. Um, but every single psychological indicator had decreased. So stress and anxiety was higher, the negative emotions. Joy, um, generosity, kindness was lower. Um, prayer, spirituality, uh, consideration of the consequences of one's actions was lower. Also lower was dribble namsa, the etiquette of courtesy, respect for the elders, respect for the community. Lower was volunteering in terms of days. Lower was a sense of belonging. And so in a place like that, where you see both kinds of change at the same time, it can lead to a very interesting conversation where people are aware of positive and negative changes and that can be catalyzed to a very profound level of discussion about where we want to go. Um, that was nationally and so the question is how we can do it subnationally. Usually subnationally and in most countries we only have poverty data but at least sharing those back and I can see I'm poorer than they are or I'm less poor than they are and in some places I'll end with one happy consideration. Amartya Sen talks about the constructive value of democracy. And so if there are various communities and then um, you see that the community next to you is much poorer, then there are considerations where in the allocation of provincial resources, um, provincial governors have been happy to have a less, lesser allocation because they now know what they didn't know before, which was the circumstance of suffering, the, the strain of their neighboring community. And so in terms of growing the social fabric and in terms of then also um, perhaps a, an interesting participatory angle uh, of participating not only for one's own well-being, but the well-being of, of others, um, that can be an, an interesting space of exchange. So there are possibilities, many of them are not yet used. Thanks. So what would you say, John, about how, how some of these possibilities of participation uh, this, these local understandings tell us about the place of subsidiarity and more broadly in human flourishing and development. Well, there's a huge, you know, it might be said, I'm not, I'm none of it is comparable in that gripping woman's character to the one just said. Um, at the, the basic level, the, the, the truth that what we're talking about as fulfillment or flourishing or aspects of fulfillment or flourishing or elements in it. Goods, and basic goods, etc. All of them, as I said, but worth repeating, are what we are directed to by first principles of reason, and so they are reasons for that action. Thinking of them as reasons for action then gives us a clue to the importance of action. What does action mean? Uh, it means the human persons having chosen uh, to do something in preference to uh, and so they figure all these goods and uh, aspects of fulfillment that have been figure in liberation. They are the content of liberation towards choice. Liberation towards choice is something that's done by an individual, but often it's done with 
identify an individual as a member of a group. So groups deliberate and groups act. They don't act, of course, without individuals acting. They are just groups of individuals, but still it's a, a group action is highly significant, like the action of a team, uh, the move uh, that a team makes and the goal that the team is toward, which is also supported by the people, but it's the team. So the reality of uh, action is something that not only achieves an empirical effect in the world, but shapes up the persons who chose to engage in it to be the sort of persons who do that sort of thing, sort of thing that John Paul II used to talk about as the intransitive uh, effect of action, the effect that lasts as a character but not as an active person. All that is of, of huge importance in the human fulfillment if one is just a consumer, a recipient, uh, not really a participant except in the passive sense, then what one is missing out on a huge dimension of human fulfillment. So the good of practical reasonableness not just some abstract thing, but reasonableness in choosing, in acting. Um, that's an action that a choice that I might make for myself, but often it will be for my, my, for my class, my family, my children, uh, my spouse, etc., etc. My local neighborhood association, my church group, um, the town council, the county. Uh, and then, yes, there's a, a great range of responsibility for national, state, and political bodies, but there's a huge amount of life that is lived uh, at a level that, that hardly penetrates us through. And where it does penetrate, it should be penetrating to assist people to make responsible good decisions for themselves and for their families and for other voluntary groups. We have some time for your questions too. Um, Dan, why don't we start back there? Well, uh, what a wonderful panel. Uh, Sabina, you had mentioned in your work, um, which I'm very interested in John's work and then Arch and Sen. I wanted to ask, ask John, I mean, can you uh, identify some of the key commonalities or differences that your approach would have with, with the Mark and Sen? I know that's a big question, but yeah. are there a couple of salient points you can point to? Well, I, I can probably answer Paolo's question without my his or uh, uh, Pascal. Uh, Sen, who, whom I you know, engaged in some discussions with back in my 80s, late 70s, perhaps 80s, in Oxford, um, we were in the same sort of circle for a while. Uh, Sen, in his wonderful you know, work 30 years later, like on the idea of, in his book, the idea of justice and, and so forth. Um, so to speak, sidles up to all these issues, but doesn't, in the end, commit himself to um, identification of um, basic versus non-basic, or indeed of, of a decisive significance list of reasons and, and basic versus at all. In, in his discussion there, he refers to Malcolm Nussbaum's list, and uh, he doesn't commit himself to the list, but he points to it as a, a list that might be given. Uh, and when you look at her list, um, it has some significant commonalities with mine. It's also you know, a structure of the list of about the same length. But uh, I've talked about this in the introduction to the first volume of my collected essays on the Ralph Hanks 1213, uh, comparing her list with mine and commenting on her list and the way she injects into the list various cultural and moral evaluations which are not, not basic. That doesn't show that they're mistaken, but it, it shows that she's mixing in what I regard as two levels as if they were one. And conspicuously, um, her list doesn't include marriage and family. It includes reproductive health, reproductive choice. So these are a kind of individualistic spin on the relevant basic good. They're, they're important considerations, but they're not good that's the state uh, in its most basic and socially significant character. So there's a critique to be done there of the sin. Now the other aspect of sin is that when, when he comes to the problem of the incommensurability with each other of each of these basic goods and the incommensurability of their instantiations made by choice by individuals and by different individuals and so forth, a massive problem which is 
the answer to which is a, a whole series of moral responsibilities that one can generate by thinking about fairness, by thinking about the reason not to deliberately, intentionally destroy any of the basic goods in anyone's life. Um, when, he, when he talks about responsibility, he waves it off. Uh, he says it's not a practical problem. We just do identify something as preferable and something as non preferable. We don't have to have that. Um, that he takes it too easily as a wrong walking did too when he was confronted with the same sort of objection. What's the problem here? What, is the stra what are the strategies for confronting you? Yeah, well, thank you very much for the, for the talk. I have two brief questions, perhaps one for each. On the question of, of poverty and poverty reduction and what the dimension of poverty, it, considering that it's such a good innovation in terms of looking at poverty from different variables and dimensions as a traditional measures, to what extent should we somehow take into account the question of equality and inequalities in, in the terms of the integrity of human development? For example, I come from Chile, in Latin America. So we have done a great deal about poverty reduction in the last 20 or 30 years, which is quite impressive. Let's say from 40 to 10 percent, although most of the nation is 20 percent. <laughs> it's more demanding, it's okay. So how to consider the question of the equality and inequalities, because we are lagging very much behind in terms of inequality reduction. Uh, so that's my, my first uh, question. And of course, there's a qualitative consequence here, because if you have a poverty of 40%, where focalizing is very important because it's so huge. When it comes out to 10, you move not only to focalizing, but to more universal incorporation of rights or benefits or whatever you want to call it. So that's on the poverty question and inequalities. And, and my second question is on the question of subsidiarity and the social teachings of the church, because somehow, and this has been in the discussion in Latin America, there are like two views about subsidiarity, at least. One that's called it liberal, neoliberal, whatever you want to say, which is how the state has to abstain from doing this and that in terms of a smaller unit that can do it, you know? But there's a kind of social Christian approach to subsidiarity, which was much more interesting because the state is an agent for the common good, you know? So there's not only a passive uh, attitude, but a more positive attitude. So to what extent, I think, was John Paul II thing, Cetas and Mosanos, you have to consider both subsidiarity and solidarity as two sides of the same coin, so to speak, avoiding that kind of narrow understanding of, of subsidiarity that comes from perhaps a liberal or neoliberal a tradition vis-a-vis -vis the social question. Why don't you take the first question first? Um, so in terms of inequality, there's inequality among the poor, and there are lots of measures in that that we work on that ourselves to measure inequality among the poor. But I think the larger question in Chile or in other places is inequality across the entire distribution. And then the question of distribution of what? Because the, the identity of many of the dimensions of multidimensional poverty really are not even present among the, the upper um, stratum of society um, unless they are voluntarily chosen. Um, and so you can make multidimensional inequality measures, and there's a whole wonderful literature, there's actually more written on multidimensional inequality measurements than on multidimensional poverty measurements. Um, but I think one way of thinking about it which is useful is to, um, instead of looking at the average achievement of a society, to adjust it by the inequality. So the Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index says, well, the Human Development Index is, in a sense, um, the potential human development we could actually reach in a society. But when you adjust it by inequality, with some inequality aversion parameter that you set, it comes down and you say, well, actually, e equivalently distributed HGI, in our case, is not 0 0.8, it's actually 0 0.6. And so you can see the loss of human development due to inequality. Um, and so you can't start from a poverty measure which only covers the base of the distribution. You have to start from a well-being measure. But in, in non-monetary spaces as well as monetary spaces, you can adjust that average by an inequality measure, then using the Atkinson index, for example, have a very intuitive idea that if we were to look at the average human development in our community, it could be 0.8, but because of inequality, it's actually 0.6. Then, then there's a, a sense of the cost of inequality to the wider well-being. Um, so I think that that would be the entree that we might be looking at. 
if you look objectively, what's interesting is in American, uh, Latin America, um, there's not an association between high inequality and high poverty. So it's, it's really nationally, nationally distinct, but they move in different realms, mainly because inequality is measured in the monetary space. Um, and social services, you would think um, that governments would be able to provide them more in places with less inequality or whatever, but it's not the case. So there's a, there's a project to do to unpack the relationship, but it's not monetary. Yeah. So subsidiarity comes from uh, the Latin word subsidium, which central meaning of which is to help, to assist. Uh, and so the principle of justice articulated by Pius XI as the subsidiarity says that what he calls higher associations of groups should see their role and responsibility as assisting uh, those lower, smaller uh, units such as the family, which is the same, that the family and the neighborhood and civic associations, voluntary associations, and so forth. Now, uh, that by itself doesn't settle anything other than a general uh, check uh, on seeking to, to respond to a problem like inequality uh, as measured by one of these indexes or it's factored into one of these indexes. How do we go, how do we go towards raising that combined index? What, what would be the effect of the measures we might take to alleviate poverty? And one kind of measure might be like Lenin takes, which is to assign responsibility for eliminating inequality to a Politburo, uh, devises a 10 year plan and assigns to everyone in the visiting country their role within the 10 year plan. And in that way, we can perhaps eliminate poverty and all sorts of other good things. Uh, an alternative way would be to say, no, that has a whole lot of costs that are built into it um, in terms of individual freedom. Uh, Freedom, etc., etc. It's not just freedom, but uh, elimination of all kinds of aspects of society in order to bring people into a position in which they will accept the correction of the college for and so forth. So let's look at an alternative method. At the other extreme, we might have a, some sort of neoliberal project for assigning responsibility for raising the standard of living of the poorest uh, to uh, a, a dynamic market. Dynamic because it's free wheeling and it's free booting and, and free from monopolies and so on. Um, and then we have to look at the effects of, of that. And again, but in each case, we, the subsidiarity says uh, what you're looking at is a common good, an aspect of which is the self determination of individuals and small groups of that. Uh, that's a good in itself. So it is practical reasonableness in action. So they can do good. And so that mustn't be lost sight of in adoption of means with all their side effects. Subsidiarity of the principle is not a recipe to our happiness in a directive to consider a whole range of side effects of action, social action for a common good regard in it. Pseudo -tech technical ways. If we're an engineering project, you build your bridge, assess all the cost, uh, and you go for the, the most of the bridge with the least economic cost, and, and that's that, that kind of simple measure of efficiency uh, simply doesn't apply in a straightforward way to a, a group of individuals who are not like bits and pieces of steel and concrete to fit a perfect bridge, uh, but whose life has its own integrity uh, as chosen by them. Uh, but there was obviously sign of their responsibility to participate in projects for common good and the common good. Any questions? Yes, sir, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, both your fascinating to see both the origins and the discussion. I have a, a couple of questions about power. Which, which was absent in the discussion, and it tends to be very absent in my view in much of the discussions of human development and what you mentioned afterwards. I will have many other questions about power, but just a couple. To Sabina is, in what ways actually measuring things differently is shifting 
own both real policies in some of the countries you guys work on, but also it's leading to a redistribution of power, or at the end, you simply have a much nicer indicator, think about Mexico, but at the end, policies are driven by many other factors, and, and um, the nice belief that more information and better discussion will lead to other things is actually not materializing because of power relations. And, and then um, my other question is, is also about power in terms of marriage. So um, as soon as you move from the personal to the, to the social and the interactions, of course, the role of power and power inequalities become very significant, and in this case, gender inequalities as well. Um, so, so my question is, in which ways the fact that marriage is in the way they actually take place in the world tend to be very unequal institutions should affect our reading of them as basic um, goods, or in which ways it's irrelevant because it's about a normative, much broader normative uh, read. Mr. Manager, you'd like to begin? I don't, well, uh, is about marriage. Um, the central case of marriage is one uh, freely entered into by people of sufficient maturity to make genuinely autonomous choices. Uh, that doesn't exclude aspects of, um, of, of what might be very, very loosely be called uh, arranged marriage, but that's a spectrum which ranges from severely problematic or dominated choices um, to uh, simply a network of, of information and so forth, uh, which then potential spouses can make autonomous choices uh, being helped by introduction and so on. It all enters, it all, it's all complicated in real life, of course, by the interaction between the, the, the two families that are involved in a central case marriage uh, and their property relations whether there is a property transaction that is parallel to the company's thinking plan. So working out the, the dynamics of, of the economic power and social and political power is, is something that has to be done in real time, in the real context. Um, but the, the idea and the ideal is of a, a self-directed commitment by two free persons to an ongoing act which will indeed be, be a lifetime act, living out long commitment for the sake of each other, in genuine friendship for each other, uh, and with a hope of expanding this love into a new generation, for which we will be responsible as the only generous we will have power over this new generation for a while, but power should always be conceived of, should always be conceived of, normatively as responsibility. Uh, and so what we talk about is the political problem of power, and how what you meant is the pejorative sense of power, is uh, the capacity to affect other people's decisions without a new sense of responsibility uh, and of obligation to their well-being. So it's a very interesting question, and we had talked earlier about some things that we couldn't cover here, but um, of what how my understanding has changed a little bit um, because being taught as an economist, you're not taught about power or you know intent in the interactions with polit political actors. But I would say that uh, we work now with many governments who are using multidimensional poverty measures for policy, and we have the privilege to work with people in positions of power in those governments. And I think it's the same thing. You're wondering what is their vocation? And what is their vocation in terms of service from wherever they sit? And what's beautiful is almost the, the reverse of what you said. It's not that the information isn't used, it's that on the measurement side, we're trying to say, well, how can what we measure align with where there's space for movement? Where, where there's a priority, where there's a, a committed, motivated actor. And so you want clearly to have a measure that will serve them. They may have interests besides behind this in terms of other jobs or whatever, but I think then the space is how do you invite and try to help them to motivate one another to, to infect 
other people with that same commitment to reduce poverty and to navigate their their own systems, networks, and and professional colleagues to focus on a new pro project and make a new breakthrough in it. Um, and I think just framing it that way is an offering that they can that people can take up, um, but that actually for many people might connect with some one of the reasons they got into politics in the first place was to do this kind of good work. And sometimes it's obscured because all the incentives seem to give them incentives to do other things and to try to make poverty reduction. Um, and when they succeed, something that gives them political credibility, something that's made visible and celebrated, that may be part of, of what they need to have the space to act in. I guess that's, that's a bit of our hope. I think we have time for at least one more. Another question? Yes. Okay. Thank you for such an interesting panel. I have a question for Sabina, and uh, also interested in knowing a little bit more about um, how governments and how policy makers have you can use uh, these multi-poverty, uh, multi-dimensional poverty uh, measurements. So I was thinking that perhaps for uh, yeah, for governments in general, it can be sometimes difficult to come up with a policy that can actually improve this uh, multi-dimensional measurement, right? Because there are several uh, measures that are being uh, taken into consideration. And therefore, one could think that uh, the way to improve it is uh, implementing different types of policies in different areas. Uh, so that might bring a lot of difficulties for, for states in general to, to combine the, the right set of policies that will actually help an improvement is instead of let's say, um, considering different and separate measurements uh, about poverty and then targeting each measurement with a single policy. I don't know if I'm explaining my book correctly. Yeah. So I was wondering how, how, how do, you, do you think uh, governments can, can circumvent this type of, of differences? Yeah, no, there's a concern if something is made up of 10 different moving parts. Can yeah, I that, yeah. Isn't it easier to have something that's one and then I understand it and I know what to do? Um, and so two negative examples and one positive. Um, one is the case of Mexico. I don't know where you're from, but they launched a multi-dimensional poverty measure in 2009 that has income weighted at 50%. And other six other social rights um, equally weighted among the other 50%. But they were using 2008 data and then a financial crisis struck. And in po income poverty went up, but that was because of the macroeconomic situation, nothing to do with policy in Mexico. Food insecurity went up because of the food price shock. But the other five dimensions, health and housing services, housing conditions, um, health insurance and social protections and employment, they went down because they are more able to be directly affected by policy of government. And so I think one of the empowering features of a multidimensional poverty measure, when it's well crafted, is that it can measure perhaps more quickly changes that are policy outcomes. And of course it depends Everything depends on the individual. But to give a banal example, you put a child in school, the child gets educated, it's years before the child reduces income poverty because they're not yet in the labor force. But you put a child in school, school attendance is in the MPI, it goes down that year. And so um, there's, a, there's a better tracking of some just very common and standard things. I think the other um, observation which came out of the Millennium Development Goals and is echoed in the Sustainable Development Goals is that the dimensions of poverty are interconnected. And so it's actually not cost effective to take a silo approach and address them one by one. Just to give a practical example, in China, where they have this accurate poverty targeting, you need to go to the community. And if seven different agencies have to go, you know, the transport costs are higher. And that's a silly example, but what, um, what seems based on a lot of empirical evidence is that given certain institutional strengths and given a certain level of corruption, um, it, it is generally more cost effective and synergistic to address multiple deprivations in an in integrated or multi sectoral way and to coordinate policies. Um, and so that means building up within states or provinces, you know, different strategies depending on the composition of poverty. Um, to close with one example, in, in the case of Colombia, um, President Santos has a table with ministers, they can't send delegates, twice a year they meet to see which of their indicators are not moving and to implement new policies. And now there's a new government in Colombia and now they will, they've decided to reconstitute that round table as a way of coordinating across all the sectors. And you talk with the ministers and they say, well, I learned. I couldn't reach my health goal without 
transport to the health clinics without educated mothers, without water and sanitation. So I needed my other ministers to look good as a health minister. And so as we understand more the interconnectedness, I think these measures have a different kind of logic. Um, but it's still, there's much to be clarified. Thank you, John. Um, but my only regret is we don't have uh, all day for a seminar together on this stuff because what you uh, shared with us goes so much to the heart of what we try to do sort of at the core of the, of the mission of the Kellogg Institute of <coughs> linking, you know, very deep normative thought with uh, a, a very accurate understanding of what the reality of the world is in practice as well. Um, so you helped us a lot today and I uh, can't thank you enough. Oh, thank you. 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 Thank you.